That's what we're doing. Um, and that'll be across the board, even in the NES schools, or even in non-NES schools. We're pushing supports closer to the schools. Everything, I know this is a busy slide, sorry, but every box is a person, and below that line are people in a unit. There are three units in a division. Those are people that are away from Hattie May, closer to the schools to help support uh, the schools with central office functions. Different staffing model. I already told you that the NES schools are almost fully staffed. They're also working on hiring teacher apprentices and learning coaches. That will prevent them from having to get any substitutes, which I know has been an issue in this district for the last couple of years. Teacher apprentices, learning coaches, Science of reading. Some of our schools have not had a curriculum tied to the science of reading. Uh, we've learned, we, the profession, have, we've learned how to teach kids well how to read. But not all textbooks and curricula are, are um, based on science of reading. And so we've got to change that. In the NES and NES aligned schools, for sure, the curriculum will be a science of reading curriculum. Dual language will continue that. We know that having two languages get you, makes you more competitive than having one. So we want to continue that in the, in the schools. I showed you this slide earlier, but I wanted to point out special education, we've got to do a lot with special education. We, we are behind. We're not serving our special needs students as well. So we're going to push more supports to the schools for special education. In the NES and NES aligned schools, your, re, your special ed resource teachers will make $90,000 as a base salary. They will also have a teacher, special education teacher apprentice. Not a paraeducator, a teacher. Assistant, not apprentice, assistant. They make 63000 or somewhere around there. So that's not a paraeducator. And those assistants will help them with the paperwork so that the SPED teacher can spend more time on instruction, not just filling up paperwork. In the classroom, this is probably the biggest slide I want to show you. We've got to change our profession to be more professional. We've got to make sure the teacher is not overwhelmed with all the non-instructional tasks. How is that a bad thing? We want to take copies away from the teacher. We don't want teachers making copies if, if we can get a copy clerk. You want to hold on to that? That's crazy. Let it go. We also want teachers to be free of grading papers outside the class. So they're all going to grade at what's called the demonstration of learning every day. They're going to know where Johnny is. Johnny has taken five quizzes this week under the teacher's tutelage. The teacher graded those five. We call them demonstrations of learning. Do I need to grade yet another piece of paper for Johnny? I know where he is. Let a learning coach or somebody else grade that piece of paper for Johnny as Johnny is doing more homework. Okay? So that's what we're going to do for the teacher. The other thing we're doing, we're, we're providing the lesson plans for the teacher. The, the PowerPoint, the demonstration of learning, the objective, the answer key, the four differentiated assignments so that they don't have to look for it at night. Teachers always say they want better work-life balance. Here it is. You leave at 4.15, you're done. You don't have to make lesson plans. You don't have to copy papers. You don't have to grade papers. You can have better work-life balance. Teachers have said that. And then there's other teachers who say, well, they should continue to do lesson plans and stuff like that. Well, we're doing what 
The modern world requires. So what do we get in return for the high salaries? We get highly effective teachers who teach like a champion. They're on. That's what we want. It's like a, I use this analogy, it's like a doctor in many ways, right? Doctors don't go in and prep the room. They don't do the MRI. They look at MRI film. They don't, you know, they don't even take the blood pressure or blood. I'm talking about the surgeons. They come in and they do surgery. They perform at the highest skill level. All that other stuff somebody else can do. Teachers, all that other stuff someone else can do. What you need to do is teach like champions. We're going to pay you a lot of money for that. High quality instruction. That's what we're going to do. That's the world we're moving to. That's what we're going to have in the NES and NES aligned schools. We're using more technology. In a couple of years, we'll use more AI based technology. And then some things are just old fashioned, like discipline. There's no technology, there's nothing fancy about this, there's nothing innovative about this. In fact, we probably need to get back to this. Okay? We've kind of lost our way a little bit. No, you don't get to disrespect an adult. And I'm not going to, I, I love middle school. I was a middle school principal. I love middle schoolers. Um, several of the schools in the network I came from were middle schools. Um, and I'm not going to debate with the 12-year-old who respected whom. The teacher says you disrespect, your, you disrespect the teacher, and we're not going to allow that. You know, so you don't get to disrespect an adult. You can't disrupt the learning environment. And you can't bully other kids. Pretty simple. Teachers like this. Teachers don't want to spend 20 minutes on one kid in the classroom. Principals we're in the NES and NES schools, you will not tell a teacher, just deal with that disruptive kid. Just deal with it. Close the door, deal with it. That's what happens out there a lot. We're not going to do that anymore. Not in the NES and NES aligned schools. Okay? Administrators will deal with it. Okay? That does not mean we're kicking kids out. It doesn't mean that we're punishing kids more than ever. It means that we're going to have a safe and orderly environment. That's what that means. You know? We're not even going to have ISS rooms. You know what ISS is? In school suspension rooms. Which most people out there have, and that's okay if they do. The NES and NES aligned schools will not have in-school suspension rooms, which are worse than what we're going to do, which is to help kids and make sure they get back online if we have to put them in a timeout. They zoom right back in to the classroom. If they have to have a timeout, they're not going to detention room or ISS room or anything like that, regardless of what you say, hear people saying who don't know what's going on. We're doing better discipline for kids. Last thing. We're open 6.30 to 5 in the NES and NES schools. Parents, you can drop your kids off early um, and pick them up at 5. For a kid, they'll have high-quality instruction. They'll be doing more, more work on their own. Guided work, though. Working in small groups. Year 2035 compensates. We're going to start that. We, in my network, we started it six years ago. Information literacy, problem solving, communications, and critical thinking. Every kid, third grade through eighth grade in my network, third grade through tenth grade here, will get critical thinking, information literacy, problem solving. It's called Art of Thinking class. We're also going to have more experiences for kids. Not only will a kid get an elective every day, that hasn't changed. On top of that, twice a week they'll get some sort of uh, additional class like martial arts, piano, photography, um, we did have judo once, uh, yoga, 
any number of things, dance, spin bike, all of those things. In the NES and NES aligned schools, I have to raise money for this, but I am raising the money. Eighth graders will travel out of country. They have to meet minimum requirements though. What are those? 92% attendance. We're not asking for perfect attendance, but 92% is reasonable. No suspensions. Okay? The average kid should not be suspended. This is incentivizing kids not to be suspended. Seventh graders will travel out of state. Eighth graders travel out of country. Seventh graders out of state. So in the network I came from, eighth graders went to Japan this year. Last year, the eighth graders went to Costa Rica. Seventh graders went to D.C. both, both years. Washington, D.C. both years. Travel is one of the most important things we can do for our kids. Travel. I know a lot of your kids have traveled, but many of our kids have not traveled. So we need to help them with that. By the way, we pay for everything. We will get their passports, and we will pay for it. And that alone is an experience. You should, you should I mean, I'm serious. I've seen kids, when they get their passports passed out, it's just... It's some, it's, that alone is an experience. Kids are just awed by that. It just gives them a new sense of perspective. So, yeah, we're going to do that. And then the environment for kids, the orderly environment for kid, from a kid perspective is those three things. Next week, a bunch of principals are going out to Ector College Prep. It's an example of a new education system school. And they're going to see it firsthand because the kids have already started. They, started. they start tomorrow, August 2nd. And then they'll, um, what day is today? August 1st, right? Yeah, OK. <laughs> they start tomorrow. The principals are going out next week. Someone will go out Monday and Tuesday. Others will go out Wednesday and Thursday to see either Ector College Prep, which is a middle school with 1,400 kids, or Sam Houston Elementary School, which is an elementary school with 470 kids, or Lamar Elementary School, which is another elementary school with about 450 to 500 kids. So they'll go out and they'll not only visit the schools and see the team centers, they'll see the LSA work, They'll see everything I'm talking about. They'll see the spin bites. They'll see the dyad program. And then they'll come back and they'll be, have a better feel for what we're talking about. Okay? Whew. All right. That was a lot. We have 30 minutes, though, for questions. So um, if you have a question, please uh, take only a minute to ask it. Or if you have a comment, that's fine, too. But please just... Just use a minute so we, we get as many people to answer the questions in, in 30 minutes. And do we have microphones? We have a microphone here and a microphone there. If you don't mind stand, you know, getting to the mic so that you get your questions answered. And also, please ask the board questions. They're here. If you have questions for the board, please ask them. Um, I already warned them that if it's a really hard question for me, I'm just going to give them the mic. All right, you go first. Oh, how you doing? My name is Savon Moore. I'm a parent of two kids at um, Mac Reynolds Middle School. Last year, we had got funding for the Magnus School program, so I'm wondering will the Magnus School program still continue at our NES school? Yeah, thank you. And this is a former Army Ranger. So... Uh, Thank you for your service, sir. You may not know what the Rangers are. They're an elite force. Thank you for, for being a, an Army Ranger. The answer to your question is, all the NA schools that had magnet programs, not magnet schools, magnet programs, were going to accommodate. So let's say, and I, I've seen the list of programs. Let's say the school had guitar. Well, guitar will either be an elective or it will be a dyad meaning a, a, a course that kids take twice a week. Uh, so we're going to try to accommodate everyone, every one of the programs. That's the answer. Over here. 
Um, okay, you got rid of all the librarians in the NES schools because you say that librarians are not a priority for NES students. The way you talk about NES students, you make it sound like almost none of them know how to read well enough to deserve to read books. You also make it sound like they will never be able to read well enough to deserve to read books. You don't seem to have much faith in your science of reading curriculum. When an advanced student finishes their work at an NES school, they have to go to the team center and do busy work packets. When an advanced student at a wealthy HISD school finishes their work early, they can go ask the librarian to recommend books to read and read book after book after book. The more books a student reads, the better their vocabulary and reading skills become. You claim to want to close the achievement gap. You will not do that if rich kids get librarians and poor kids get busy work packets. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, it'd be nice to really see what goes on in the team center, to really understand the LSAE model, because if you think there's a busy work packet, you don't know the model. If you think they don't read a lot in the team center, you don't know the model. If you think that books only exist on library shelves, you don't know the model. So um, I would suggest you find out more about it uh, before you criticize it. Next, next one. Hi, um, I'm a parent of three kids and I wanted to basically express the concern with um, a, a special education if um, there could be more communication from the um, from the main office over to the schools about how we're going to be impacted at non NES schools and also at NES schools, and um, if we could close the gap on the communication, that would definitely help out. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the, raising that concern. Look. Um, We've not done well in special ed services. You, you probably already know that one of the exit criteria for um, getting out of intervention is special education. We have to comply with state and federal law and improve special ed services. Otherwise, we can't get out of the intervention. So we're working hard to do that, not just in the NES and NES aligned schools. So the, that chart you saw with special ed being pushed closer to the schools, it's partly an answer to where's the, the, your question, partly an answer to that, so that we, we are more attentive to your school and your area. Um, the other thing is, this year, the first time ever, I think, special education compliance and success outcomes are 20% of a principal's evaluation. So we're serious about turning that around. I don't think that's anywhere in the world or in America where a principal's evaluation is tied to SPED outcome success and compliance. So it's still not going to be perfect. We got a ways to go, okay? But we are definitely starting and hopefully our communications will be much stronger this year. Uh, where am I? I'm over here, yeah. Thank you for this forum. My name is Jill Wood, and I'm the parent of a fifth grader at an HISD school in a dual language program. And I also work with children with learning disabilities, and I run a play-based after-school program. So my question is very specifically about recess. And I'm one of those recess advocates you mentioned earlier. Um, I heard your data points, and, and there's no question we need to be doing better. Um, but research tells us that learning doesn't happen in a vacuum and reading and math and critical thinking especially are learned best by moving physically and moving in a highly motivating environment. Um, and a diet is great, but it's not motivating the way recess is. Um, I know that from working with kids and also working in a place where there's lots of other options. Um, and so I guess I want to know uh, when I looked at the the schedule for NES schools, I saw that there were 10 minutes fewer in fourth and fifth grade, and that um, K through third are broken into two 15-minute segments, and I'm also on the, um, the board at Link 
in Dallas. So I wonder if you're using that research to break into two pieces, the 30 minute time, but the LINK project has four recesses a day. And so I think I, my concern is that when you have 15 minutes, a lot of that is gonna happen in transit and kids are gonna lose the opportunity to be in a space where they learn those soft skills that are preparing them for 2035 because we know that happens in a recess environment. Yeah, so um, the kindergarten, first, second, and third have 30 minutes of recess. Fourth grade actually has 25 minutes, uh, and I, I suspect they'll find a way to, to move that to 30, and fifth grade has dyad for recess. Um, so dyad is twice a week, at least an hour each time, which allows the kids to do more movement, and, and remind, remember they have 30 minute lunch, and they have a um, one hour elective every day. So there's gonna be plenty of movement. Most of the dyad courses are physical, spin, PE, dance, martial arts. So there's a lot of brain breaks and free time for fifth graders. So recess is not going away, as you can see. My name is Adriana Hazley. I am a school counselor at an uh, NES aligned school. Um, when my principal chose, because it was a, uh, our administration chose to go NES aligned, it wasn't a collaborative vote. When we went to our meeting, it was this is how it's going to be. Um, you don't have a choice. If you don't agree with it, then maybe this is not the school for you. That's exactly how it went. So me, I love what I do. Uh, the kids are the best part of my job. So I did, I'm not sure about what NES is, so I sought um, to go to a non-NES school, secured two positions. Each principal sent in a transfer for me and was told NES aligned people cannot um, transfer. This is the second time to even today. I secured a position at a high school. It's a raise for me because I've moved from 10 months to 11 months and it's uh, advancement in my career and it seems as though now this whole system has, is holding me hostage into a position that I can't even advance my career. And even you talk about money, it's more money for me, but I'm stuck and oppressed in this school where I can't move because my school is NES aligned and not NES. Why? Well, look, I, I'm not going to talk about any individual case, even yours. You wouldn't want me to, to do that for anybody else, so I'm not going to do that. And I don't know all the facts. Today was the last day to transfer. Look, we pushed that transfer to as far as we could. At some point, you have to cut it off. The, real, the original transfer was over a month ago, right? That, that teachers had to make a decision as to where they are, all right? We kept pushing it because we had 57 schools uh, sign up at the, you know, after, only like three weeks ago. So we had to push that date, but guys, come on. At some point you have to cut it off because you can't have musical chairs. School starts in three and a half weeks, three weeks. Right? So we cut it off and today was the date. So I suspect that's why it was not transferred. But look, and I don't want, I don't want to be, you know, I, I will answer her question the way I want to answer it. I'm answering it. I'm not going to answer her specific question because I wouldn't do that for anybody specifically. I'm answering the question more broadly. You'll get your chance in a second, ma'am. Uh, so to finish, though, yes. Uh, in most cases, the principal did a survey of the staff. In some cases, I don't know if they did or didn't. They were given directions to listen to the staff or at least ask the staff and at least their <coughs> shared decision-making teams. But in the end of the day, look, and no one has ever said this to teachers, but I'm saying it. It's a choice where you work. There's enough vacancies out there in the, in the world that you need to choose. If you feel oppressed, you should not work in a place you feel oppressed. You should go someplace where you don't feel oppressed. Next question. Yeah, 
Yeah, hi, my name is Ann Furs, and I have a quick question about my neighborhood school and another elementary school that I'm familiar with. Uh, I was, uh, I'm impressed with HISD's vision statement, which is, guarantees equitable access for all kids to an equal education. My school, my neighborhood's elementary school is Westview Elementary. It's a very high achieving school, 6% economically disadvantaged. They have a beautiful library, a certified librarian, and they will always have that. Um, across town, another school I'm familiar with is Lockhart Elementary. That's 90% economically disadvantaged. They have a, a wonderful librarian and a library full of ESSER books, federally funded ESSER books that just came this past year. STEM kits, great progress. However, uh, the principal just signed up to be an NES aligned school. The librarian is now gone. The library is now gone. The books are off the shelves. They're in a pile on the floor. And I, looking at an HISD's vision statement about equitable access, 90% economically disadvantaged, no library, no librarian, 6% ec economically disadvantaged, beautiful library, wonderful librarian. I'm just wondering how you reconcile that. First of, first of all, I, I'm sorry those books are on the floor. That should not be. I've not seen that anywhere I've been, but that sh they should put the books on the shelf, okay? Okay, well, they, sh they should. They should put them on the shelf. Um, none, of, none of the books are, are gone from the libraries that I, that I know of. Um, to answer your question, Destination 2035, what we're trying to do is mostly about equity. That is the focus. But people want to hold on to what they have and they, they may not have a bigger perspective of what equity is. I, I have colleagues who will say, you don't have equity unless you have an equity officer. You don't have equity unless you have the same number of teachers over here versus over here. You don't have equity unless you have the same class size. And what I say to them is, you really want equity? How about you put your most effective teachers with your least effective kids? That's equity. How about you get the kids to read just like the kids over here can read? That's equity. You want to think that some, you know, some level of books? We used to count chairs. We used to credit schools, we counted chairs desks, number of books in the library. A librarian came up to me today and said, you know what, I'm no longer a librarian, I'm a teacher. But when I was a librarian, only 18 books on average for a whole class was checked out in a year. In HISD. So, hold on, I'm answering the question. Equity is not just about libraries. You have to prioritize if you want to do different things. We're going to do some other things when we put $20 million in CTE, you want equity? We're going to prioritize the low-performing schools. Look at Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan CTE Center in the underserved part of our community. And then you look at the equity in some of those wealthier places of town. And CTE in those places are different than CTE at Barbara Jordan. There is no robotics, computer programming, graph designs, science, coding, there's not that here. And you want to talk about equity. I'm going to do something about that equity. We're going to put more money into it because that's what kids need for the year 2035. They need to know how to read. They need to know CTE. They need AI. That's equity. So this is about equity. And I challenge anybody to say it's not. Well, I'd just like to say that the, the woman who was in front of me in line, I was kind of listening to that exchange. She's been here for a while. She was probably here working her career several years before you arrived. And when you said to her, um, if you feel a breast, go find another job, you kind of said, take it or leave it. And I feel like, you know, doing that to uh, teachers and, and accredited counselors in this environment of shortage is is a bit short-sighted and certainly I found it disrespectful but that is not my question
My question is, is, uh, it is very interesting about the travel, and it sounds really lovely, and I also uh, got really thrilled as an adult when I got my passport for the first time. But I have been wondering uh, whether we have undocumented children who are not able to obtain passports, and if they are, if there's any provision made for them uh, when they cannot go out of country, do they go again to the seventh grade DC trip, or, or what kind of consolation prize or, or other arrangements are made for those kids? So we have an obligation for any kid who steps through the door to educate them well. That's number one. Um, with regard to a passport, obviously we can't get passports for all kids. In the cases where we can, we will try to get that child to travel to in-country, in out of state. Uh, so if they are an eighth grader and they meet the eligibility requirements for attendance and no suspensions, then we will send them to D.C. or wherever the seventh graders are going. That's, that's what we can do. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Stephanie McIntyre. I was a computer science teacher in New Jersey. Um, I actually recently got offered a CTE position here doing a job fair. Um, so I just want to say that um, I've been telling everyone what you're telling them about AI. AI is going to change everything. And it certainly should change education. I'm very excited about that prospect. Um, education's always behind where the rest of society is as far as technology is concerned. So this is very exciting to me. I've been beating the drum of AI for, for since it came out. Um, and I'm excited to work in the district in that capacity. I just, I came up here to talk really about the whole library thing. And um, because it's incendiary, it, it really is. That, that what's been put out is very incendiary. It's saying, Poor kids aren't getting libraries, rich kids get to keep theirs. And, and no matter if you didn't mean it to be that way, it's been spun that way. And now people are up in arms about that. And I think, um, with all due respect, a certain sensitivity towards that may go a long way and maybe a, more, a better explanation of, of your vision for that. I understand there are gonna be these team rooms and all that. But people don't know what that is. People know what a library is. And a lot of people, especially teachers, got their love of teaching and learning in a public library or in a school library when they were very small. That's where I got my love of reading. And so you are sort of, you know, you're asking people to change this paradigm, but you really have not put out there, like, that's an emotional thing. I'm sorry I'm going on, but they go, a library, people feel an emotional connection to a library. They want that for their kids. They want their kids to read. They want books. If you're going to do something else, just respectfully, I would say a little bit more description of what you're going to do would might go a long way to get more support. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, always good advice to have more description. Just keep in mind this. Um, there are a dozen, maybe 20 sacred cows. We haven't even gotten to the athletic period in schools. We haven't gotten to some elective programs versus AI, CTE programs. We haven't gotten there yet. But we've already touched some sacred cows. And there's gonna be people, no matter how often we explain it, even in a way that's sensitive. I've been at these community meetings for, I don't know, all summer. I've had press availability for, I don't know, every, after every community meeting except this one. Um, and I've explained it. And then you're gonna have people who say, the headline, because it sounds good, I'm not gonna repeat it here because it's misinformation, but a misinformed headline that captures the imagination, right? Because we all know what a library is, right? And we all know what a, you know, I, I won't, I'm not gonna spread the misinformation myself. Anyway, so one thing I can promise you though, we'll stay focused on what we have to do. Because every sacred cow out there 
people want you to step back from reform. That's why the district is where it is. Where were the people who wanted a better district prior to June 1st? Where were they? How come we're still here, right? How come we didn't transform? How come the achievement gap is the same? How come the still kids still can't read? Why? So, no, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna do bold, transformative change, and there's gonna be people out there that are gonna try to stop it. And guess what? We're gonna keep our eyes on the kids, not on adults, and we're gonna make a change for them to get them ready for year 2035. Next question. Hi, uh, my name's Ann Eagleton, and um, you speak a lot about how much you um, how much you care and a big part of your program is quality instruction. So in looking through the board meeting agenda, I was very surprised to see a policy in which you strike out the requirement of verifying an applicant's information before hiring them. I'm trying to understand why you wouldn't vet a person that you're gonna put in front of students. It seems dangerous and it makes zero sense to what you're saying you're trying to do. Okay, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, but every person in the district has to have a background check, has to have uh, their credentials like bachelor's degree check, uh, in most cases certifications check. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about, um, but we're gonna get qualified people because if we're gonna have high quality instruction, if we're gonna move the needle on our scores, and on kids' ability to read, then we have to have high quality teachers. Hello, yes. One of the first meetings I went to, I brought up the fact that you would use the proficient numbers up here, 30% reading, whatever, 18%. And then today you said specifically that was equivalent to being on grade, except by your own NEA people, it is not. In fact, when you actually look at the difference, it was between 30 and 50 points that our kids were actually passing, but you don't define the proficiency. Proficiency is almost like master level. They completely know it compared to on grade. So whenever we tell you a fact, you turn around and say, oh, you haven't researched it, you don't know what you're talking about, but when you tell us a fact, it's gospel. And that's not right. It has been leaked that there are Computers and tablets now being cycled out of use at some of your schools. This was money that taxpayers paid for our students to have. How does this um, relate to when you cannibalize our libraries? I, I don't understand the second question. On, on the first... Taken out of schools on the first and removed from classrooms. Tablets, computers, the, they're not being the, processed back for the kids to use. The question? Yeah, that was the question. And now you're going to the libraries and their books. The question is that, are they? I'm telling you they are. Okay, and so your question is? How are you going to relate that to when you cannibalize our libraries? How are we going to replace our books? Okay, so um, we're, we're not cannibalizing the library, so I don't understand that question. But let's... On the data piece, guys, I, first of all, I said it was a proxy. You can look at any data. The data in the United States, depending on, is around a third of our kids can read at grade level. Whether you want to say grade level, proficient or above, meets and exceeds, you're, you're losing the forest for the trees. There's no question that we have low proficiency in this country. You want to use 30%, 30%, what do you want to use? You want to say proficient, you want to say meets and exceeds? Okay, so that's what I complain about, is that you're losing the picture. The picture is that we're not proficient. You want to argue that we are? Then please do provide data for it. We're not. So you're nitpicking and you're not right about the data. So look it up again until you get it right. Next question. Hi, my name is um, Anne. I'm a parent of an eighth grade second grader who's dyslexic. Um, she's getting great interventions at her school. Also, 
time with the librarian once a week and comes home with books that she's checked out every single week and excited to read. Um, so decoding is important, but also that practice of reading is really important for our children with learning differences. Because if you train the brain and you practice, right, that can make all the difference for instruction. So it matters to me desperately how we're focusing on reading for my child and for every single child in the JHC. Um, so my question to you all, you all did the Lone Star Governance Training, you know that the responsibility of the board is to represent the vision and the values of the community. Um, and I saw you all do that at the first board workshop, where you asked the superintendent, what about the schools that are high performing? What about the magic school? Are you going to promise that nothing's going to change there? And you got that assurance. But I'm surprised. You know, Stevenson, it was complimented, it's a B-plus school, it's a few. It's an A-plus school, it was a 95 on the, the state grading system. And when the community came out and said, this school is working for us, and the evidence is there, the data, it, it, where were you to step in and say, like, the vision of the, and the values of the community are represented here. It's a dual language school, it's a school that's working for our kids, why is the model changing? Yeah. You've heard now the, the, the value, I'm sure people have sent you the research on the value of a certified librarian, how that impacts not just test scores, but lifelong learning and, and citizenship for children. It would cost $5 million, less than that, to put librarians, certified librarians, back into the 50 NES schools. And we're talking about $20 million for AI CCE. We're talking about 10 or $20 million to take kids overseas. Those are all nice. But why can't it be NES plus librarian? Why are, I mean, well, I don't understand. That's not logical. But it must be, if we're going to do NES, that we can't do librarian. So my question to you all is, when are you going to step up and represent the vision and the values of the community? If you're coming to these community meetings, you tell your story. They're a lovely story. You sound like very nice people. But when are you going to do the job of representing us? Now that you've heard from the community about dual language, now that you've heard from us about how librarians are so important to us, and he's saying, when are you going to step up and represent us? So, <laughs> first, thank you for your question, uh, Ms. Sung, and thank you for your previous uh, service on the board as well. Uh, so one of the things we have mentioned as a team, and Superintendent Miles has said it as well, that our focus our NES school is making sure that they're able to read at grade level. And so from a prior prioritization perspective, we want to focus on those schools. And, and for now, um, you know, we are not filling those librarian positions, but I could see in the future as we make improvements, the board may go back to that and look at that. There's no commitment, there's no promise. But with respect to your question about vision and values, I can tell you that all of our board members are committed to our communities. In fact, I grew up in this community. Uh, I actually live in the Hobby area. My parents live in Pecan Park, which is down the road off of Galveston. So I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. Uh, I'm a coach at Dixie Little League, which some of you may be familiar with. We play baseball at OFA down the road. So I'm familiar with the vision and values of our community. At the end of the day, our parents want good schools for our kids. They want to make sure that our kids are reading, that they can do math at grade level. So we're going to go through the process. We'll continue to listen to the community. In fact, we have several meetings lined up this month of August to go to different organizations. And in the month of September, we have uh, nine, actually nine in-person meetings at schools to talk about our board goals and constraints, which you're familiar with. We'll have a virtual meeting as well. So we're listening. Uh, I have to remind everybody that we've been on the job, the unpaid job, <laughs> for two months. Uh, there's more opportunities that we're going to listen to. Um, and so we're familiar with the vision and values of our community. We're going to go out there and even learn more. And even in instances where it's information that perhaps we may not want to listen to, we're going to listen to it uh, because it's important for us to do that. Yeah, so we will take appropriate action as a board when the vision and values uh, are displayed and shared with our community. What I can tell you is that across the city, at least from my perspective, I've spoken to people that say we need a change in HISD. We need a change. Our kids should be reading at grade level. So we may not always agree on the approach, but our commitment to the students is the same commitment you had, Ms. Sung, when you were on the board, which is to ensure that our core subjects are being taught in our schools and our kids are advancing in their academic career. Uh, it's 7.15, so we're over time, but let's take four more questions. Right. Which side is first? You're, you you're first. How you doing, Mr. Miles? My name is Estonia Green. I work in transportation. My grandson goes to Ross Sterling uh, High School. And 
the other schools he went to, DeAnda, oh my God, Madding, excellent schools, he has autism. He couldn't talk when he first started school. He has some superb teachers, they helped him. But what I'm saying right now, I'm not hearing anything about special needs. Every time, every year, he's going to be in 10th grade. It's always, you got the other regular students' pictures. The children is on the background of special needs. They're not in the forefront. They don't have no bully, uh, 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 buddy system where you got a student, they got friends, interact with the children so they can learn their disability. It's not just autism, it's all other students. He's a visual learner. You got uh, a certified, he got a teacher in there. She uh, used to be a dog catcher and she tried to tell him he cannot move certain ways, but that's his disability. He's not a bad kid, he just smiles and laughs. That's all he does. And he talks and repeats things, but um, another thing I wanna know about um, how you gonna keep the money in the school budget to use for them. They didn't go on no field trips, they didn't do nothing out of the ordinary. I couldn't, um, I'm, I'm a hands-on, I'm a grandmother. His mom passed away when he was a baby. I'm hands-on grandmother. I'm there, meetings, meetings. But then you hear everybody barking, but you're not, you're not at every meeting. If you come, if you come to, if you, if you come to every meeting, you help fund your child's school. I didn't. Yeah, and, and just the didn't, question. Didn't, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I'm not finished though. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get out of here. And then uh, they said, uh, 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 I don't agree with what they're doing. I say stop the schools from lying. They say he was uh, on his uh, progress report. Poor car. He's doing algebra, he's doing biology, he's doing social studies and science. Right. And I know he's not doing that. They right. couldn't even bring the uh, paperwork to the IEP meetings or the ARB meetings. So let, let me, thank you. I got to Yeah, uh, right, we're, we're, we're trying to get to the other, other three. But um, I can't talk about any individual s circumstance, but I can tell you this. We, we've not been doing right by our special needs population. Right? That, that's clear. We have a lot of work to do. We're moving in that direction. We're gonna try to help our special needs teachers. We're gonna provide more assistance. We're gonna move supports closer to the, to the schools. So hopefully your, your grandson won't, won't be in the same position. Just, just, yeah, just one real, real quick, please. Just. I understand you says no disrespect to any adult, okay? I work in transportation. I'm on that school bus, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a assistant. I done seen teachers buck at these children, cuss them and grab them also. So it, it's a two-way person. That's so true. you're just gonna say, I'm gonna listen to you and not to that yeah, child. Uh, yeah, I know that happens sometimes too, and if we see that happen, we should address that as well. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, second one. We got Hello. two more after that. Yes, hi. I'm at an SDM, or I'm on. I'm an SDMC member at um, an NES Aligned School, and I have parents who are desperately trying to transfer out of non-NES, non-NES Aligned because of the significant valid physical and emotional safety that they are concerned about for their children. Um, we, uh, so we are. Um, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so we, uh, my question is, they've been trying to transfer. One received today a notice that said no, that she was too late, that the deadline was back in June, but we found we were going NES Align three weeks ago, so, and I asked you in a separate meeting whether they could transfer or not, and you said yes. So I'm trying to understand if they've been declined that transfer, not because of principals, but by the, by the district saying that it's too late what, how can they still transfer? Yeah, I, I, and, and I don't want to talk about the safety. I just want to know how you can, I don't want like another lecture. I would just like to know how they can transfer and how they can make sure that that's a possibility because you promised that before. Yeah, I, I don't know when the, when the new deadline was set. Uh, obviously there has to be a deadline, so I'd have to find out more information. I'm okay. asking about, you said that they could transfer. There wasn't yeah. a deadline and set for parents to transfer. Well, there's, there's, there probably was a deadline set. There's so, not seen anything okay, well, I'm trying to answer the question okay. without lecturing. So, 
I'm trying to answer the question. There probably was a deadline set. I don't know if there was or not. But obviously, at some point, you've got to set a deadline yeah, I know. for I know transfers. Deadline. So yes, I don't know when that was. But and this parent did it a week ago. We found out so, three weeks um, ago. All right. So let me find out when the deadline was. If it was before the deadline, then, then we can act on it. If it's after the deadline, then it's after the deadline. Go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm happy to see a lot of parents out here. And I know that it's taking time from everybody. So um, I just have a few questions that I haven't seen addressed. Um, well, that, um, I do want to touch back on the, um, on the multilingual program. So at what point will the program be evaluated? The dual language program? Yes. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, but um, all dual language teachers get evaluated just like other teachers. No, the student and the, grades and their uh, success rate, their passing rates. Mm -hmm. So we take different assessments. We'll take NWA, we take the TEL pass, Tell and we'll take the STAR exam. So we'll have several times when the students will be evaluated. So after the evaluation, if there is a particular score that's less, what are your plans? Do you have a plan B? Do you plan to go back to the way things used to be if the numbers were not what you expected? And also, where would that data be available for parents and the public? And also, how soon after the testing will that be available? So we will do a beginning of the year assessment, uh, usually NWA. Dibbles and Telpass. So we'll do a beginning of the year assessment. That's the baseline. And that data will be published probably at a board meeting, uh, you know, probably a few weeks after we take it. And then we do a middle of the year, and then we'll do an end of the year. So you'll have, I mean, most of that data is, will be public knowledge anyway, but you'll have that data. If, I, I also have a question. Does the NES program how does the NES program help um, jobs being outsourced and lost to artificial intelligence? And that goes for both all HISD schools and the NES program. How, what is the success rate and where can we find that information? Okay, so I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not sure of the question. So jo no jobs have been outsourced for something we, we're going to Your goal is 2035 to set these students up for success. So in order to set up the students for success, we are all, we're not just competing against each other here, right? We're competing against everyone around the world. So we are losing jobs crazy in to America. outsource yes. everywhere else because they're smarter, faster, cheaper. So how are these students going to benefit from this in 2035? Like what? What is it that your program offers? So what, what, what we're trying to do is a couple of things. One is to help them have the foundational skills to compete so that they won't have their jobs outsourced. They have to be part of the higher skills job or at least the middle level skills job. The second part is to have take advantage of year 2035 competencies, critical thinking, problem solving, working as a team, communications, learning how to learn. That's what we need for our kids so that they won't be outsourced, so that they can have those higher skills jobs after they graduate from high school. You had the last question. Um, I'm going to say in English and Spanish because, okay, I just want to say to all the parents that um, we are our kids' first teachers. Let's be honest and realistic, okay? So I was, I, my daughter used to attend to Baylor College of Medicine or Ryan. And it was absolutely sad to see that I was part of the PTO. And every single time, even virtually or person, there was only two or three parents. So let's be honest. Let's not blame the new people, right? Let's be, take responsibility that we as a parents need to be there for our kids, OK? And I'm asking you to please listen to us, to the PTO, because I sent so many proposals to the previous um, administration 
on how to get those parents uh, to help. Because let me tell you one thing, let's be honest, parents, they can have all their libraries and all their school because they're stuck up at the library, but your child gets home and they spend, there's a lot of research being done that the kids spend, if they, you will give them a phone for 24 hours, they will not eat or read, they will spend 24 hours on the phone. Not, do, not reading, not doing math, not doing sight, watching TikTok, okay? So my thing is listen to the PTO us, give me the opportunity to sing with your board, so that way we can get, especially Hispanic, not speaking, not speaking English, to get those parents to understand how important it is to get our kids to the next level. Okay? Lo va a decir en español. Los papás hispanos, nosotros somos los maestros de nuestros hijos. La educación empieza en la casa. No hay que ponerles toda la responsabilidad a los maestros, pues nuestros hijos solamente están en la escuela. Cuando lleguen a la casa, nosotros los tenemos que pucharlos a que hagan lo mejor. Tenemos el PTO en la escuela. Ayúdemos, firmen y estén en la escuela. Salgan de trabajar a las 7, a las 8, lo que sea. Yo se los puedo comprar porque tengo dos trabajos y estoy en la educación de mis hijas. My two kids are GT. And yes, I do appreciate the teachers, but they are there because I spend plain words, everything, because I want my kids. That you don't need to, let me tell you one thing in English, you don't need to be rich to be smart. If, if I could answer your question. So parent engagement is important. I've had three conversations with three or different organizations in the last month about how do we create cohorts of parents that are involved and engaged in their schools, specifically in brown and black schools. Uh, we know that there's opportunities there. I can tell you that, again, my kids go to a school not too far from here. We had no PTO because at the time a principal said, school is not for parents. And so what did we do? We said, hey, we're going to make it work. And so today I'm, I'm excited. Our, our PTO was in, uh, our school PTO with the current president was at the HIZ Expo. We have up to, sometimes up to 100 active parents in a school. Uh, we do have about 800 students, which is a big school. But here's my commitment to you. Um, email me. I will go and help your school get involved in PTO. Y se lo voy a contestar en español. Es importante que padres se involucren en las escuelas de sus papás. Mis hijos asisten a una escuela donde, al principio de intentar de iniciar la PTO, la directora nos dijo, la escuela no es para padres. Así que nosotros, un grupo de nosotros, empezamos... Y ahora, uh, gracias a Dios, tenemos hasta 100 padres o madres involucrados en las escuelas de, de nuestros hijos. Uh, así que motivamos y le pedimos a ustedes como padres que se involucren. Y yo, uh, yo si usted me manda un correo electrónico, uh, mi promesa a usted es uh, que yo vengo a ayudarles como pueda uh, y ayudarles para intentar uh, a renovar o quizás renovar un, un principio en la escuela donde más padres están involucrados. Gracias. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, her, her suggestion was at some of these schools we need to give the principals to allow parents to become engaged. Thank you. Yes. Michelle, do you, do you want to have the last word? Well, I hate to follow that. <laughs> uh, I'll just follow up by thanking, thanking everyone again for coming out. I know everyone's incredibly busy. Um, thank you again for, for joining us. We always love hearing feedback, critical feedback. Um, as Rolando and the superintendent mentioned, we will take this critical feedback back uh, to the, our fellow board members um, and turn it into action. So thank you very much for your comments this evening. Safe travels back. <laughs>